Hello, welcome. It's Deep Learning with Poly AI, and it's a new episode. I'm here with Nikola Merchik, CEO and co-founder of Poly AI. Hey, Nikola. Hey, Edmund. How's it going? Not too bad. I am in beautiful, sunny Florida, wrapping up a nice little conference. Uh, how about yourself? Not bad, not bad. Your, your voice sounds like you've been uh, socializing. Oh yeah, I think it's uh, part of the mandate. Uh, yeah, and uh, when when you're when you're on a beachside conference, you have to go out and just uh, kick back a couple my times. So thank you for noticing. I hope like maybe we tap into a whole new audience with this kind of scratchy voice. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I I uh, brought to my computer. Yes, I didn't hear the whole recording sort of go off, but we just moved to our new office in the city of London. It is as great as you'd expect. So um, I envy you. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> well uh, enjoy the new digs. I'll bring back some of the beach next time I'm there. Um, yes, anyway, uh, well, so today's topic, one and two get into this concept that's kind of flitting around in headlines. Uh, it's called AI washing, and it's essentially a modern take on greenwashing, where companies historically, back in the eco craze of being responsible to our uh, to our home planet here, would sort of overinflate the level of investment resources that they were putting towards reducing their carbon footprint and light. So basically putting up a show that says, hey, uh, we're taking care of our planet. Um, now with AI being u- u- ubiquitous with modern technology um, and it's sort of a buzzword across industries in every, in every tech, or in our case, a lot of CX environments, it's just, uh, it's everyone wants to say that they have something going on or something AI in, in their in their roster. And so this phenomenon of AI washing is coming to be. So based on your understanding Sorry, about- You term, want to use more AI or less AI, right? Because like, well, there's well, concern of AI will destroy us and you know, we'll be uploaded when we're not. And then there's the whole other piece of like, are you innovative enough? Are you using AI? When you, when you say greenwashing, I almost think that it's people claiming not to use it when, when they are. Well, I mean, I, I would say that that's sort of that counter AI movement. The AI washers are the ones that are like, hey, kids, you know, we're cool. We're him. We're also AI powered. Check out our AI. And they have no idea what they're talking about. You know, it turns out it was a tool and like building some new solution, but really not a part of their functional product itself. Now, obviously, you know, we have Poly AI. You guys back in the Cambridge days built your own language models. We built a product around this thing that ended sure. up being the conversational AI, and, and I, we have a lot of deployments using generative as well. AI is, a, it's not just our name, it's part of our core fiber, right? But a lot of companies out there aren't doing that. Um, so what are some signs that you think that people can look for if they're talking to a company to sort of sift through that over-promising of AI poweredness? Um, or you know what, instead of that, maybe let's just start with AI as a concept Right now, a lot of consumers, a lot of people who are sort of laid to the to the to the idea, it, they're probably thinking of generative, right? Because their first introduction to yeah. AI and its modern concept is like ChatGPT. So, what is artificial intelligence? What is AI as a general construct, and how long has it really been around? Yeah, I mean, like this is this is. Uh, I'm sure we've done this in a podcast before, right? But it's uh, <laughs> AI it's responsible if we did. No one has a for, or it's been around for a while, right? Like it's it's sort of hard to live place where it exactly starts. You know, like you had this famous Dartmouth conference in AI in 1966, where a bunch of professors gathered either for two weeks from the summer to solve AI. It was great, very ambitious. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't as productive as they had hoped. So um, we're still at it, right? Um, the early days of AI were mostly about um, non-statistical approaches. It was people trying to, and you know, like the fascination has uh, at the start and to this day been very much about, um, uh, you know, compu- well, not computer games, but like games or chess and, and other, other ones, like kind of like sure. showing you have a system that is intelligent by showing that it can best the human, best, right? Like Deep Flu versus Kaspero, AlphaGo, um, more recently. Um, and um, that's all fine. Those systems are, well, Deep Blue was mostly a symbolic system, right? So it wasn't learning from patterns and kind of like trying to generalize knowledge from, like, say, enforcement learning. Um, it was really much more about people writing a bunch of good algorithms for, you know, yeah. doing something. Like they're basically creating a bot that play you and they're encoding these rules that should hopefully give it the right next action in um 
in a complex space. It helped not to get too mathematical, but chess, Go, and similar games were good because um, they were these discrete systems that were fully visible and you could kind of like find what the next action is. The action space is an important concept, which is kind of like, you know, what do you do next, right? Do you have one of X moves? Because if you do, then, you know, uh, over time you can learn which one is best and hopefully you recognize familiar and unfamiliar situations. Um, and then like, you know, for a while people really, uh, focused on those things. And after some time, it's kind of like, you know, it didn't really garner all that excitement because how many decades can you work on a better chess player before people right. stop believing that you're about to, you know, create an AI that will be like omnipresent and used for absolutely everything and whatnot. Um, you had a few starts in what is kind of like considered more narrowly machine learning, which is really using statistics to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, work on a problem to do a task of a particular kind, right? It could be image recognition, it could be facial recognition, it could be speech recognition, like all sorts of things that are maybe assistive things for humans, um, all the way to kind of like full end to end task completion of, you know, I don't know, a bot that does something that you would have otherwise had to do on your computer for, for five minutes. Right. Uh, um, right. and like machine learning really kind of like took off a few times and neural network approaches had a few kind of like, uh, different phases in the nineties, people showed that, you know, the multi-layer perceptron could do some stuff, but it really wasn't even that competitive compared to other statistical approaches, like, I don't know, a random forest or, um, other classification approaches. Um, and then really kind of like, um, 2012 onwards, uh, people, you know, we entered the era of deep learning, right. And, and it hasn't really stopped since where, uh, through various different optimization methods, we got to the point that these systems became state of the art for a vast number of different tasks. Um, and you know, performance improved and improved and we got more and more confidence that uh, the whole thing, um, has a future and can do some things better than a human, right? Um, and that all kept progressing and we were all excited, right? That's the era where, um, you know, I started my PhD in 2014 and that was like, kind of like two years, um, a year and a half after, um, you know, some of the first seminal papers on deep learning came about mostly Jeff Hinton's group, right? Um, okay. But then, you know, you, you basically, the, the final flip is, um, LLMs showing that a model that is fairly generic can actually do far more than we ever initially expected it would do. We, it was built to predict the next word, right? And to tell you which sentence is more likely than another sentence by looking at the perplexity, like the collection right. of words, how likely are these words to, to go together, but like taken to an extreme and consuming all the data and then there's a bunch of other tricks and training and creating synthetic data sets where they see, uh, these language models see like, um, you know, examples of how tasks are to be formed. Uh, how questions can be answered and stuff like that. That's where then, um, you get to an interesting point where they start generalizing and generalizing in ways that you did not necessarily, you hope that they would pick it up from the, but you didn't explicitly give them a mechanism. They inferred that, uh, themselves. Right. And that's the point where I think like, usually it's like, is that, is that, is that, is that the progression? Cause like you said, going back to like the early foundational applications of AI, it was around games because it was a very finite data set. It's, it's sitting in an narrow space, like with go and chess, but now with compute, with natural increase in computing power and access to information, that's, that was the expected evolution to what we see I today. Expected it. I think what's interesting is that we all expected that these things would get better, right? But these like emerging properties, like the ability to generalize that well. I think people hoped for it. And then for a while, it wasn't really happening. And then, you know, you had a few people like Helios Hutzkever who believed that they would do far more, far, far more. Like that there would be a moment where the increase in capacity would not just be like some thing that follows mathematically the amount of data, but right. it gets to a level of capability of something that you did not intend. And that's kind of what right. our runs. And that's why uh, we're okay. all obsessed with them right now, because it really feels like we something unexpected happened. Like, it's kind of like the, you know, GPT 3.5 is really, you know, a bit of a, like an Oppenheimer moment, right? Where like Trinity test, oof, okay, the world is now different, right? We sure. have a singular yeah. system that by consuming all this data has become capable of being this almost utility function for development that can do so much more, right? And now creativity is exploited and people claim that 
well, they, they're trying to do all sorts of fascinating things, right? So I think that's where kind of like, you know, the, the whole stuff around AI washing is interesting because um, I think we've compared it to uh, at least like, you know, if you look at the life of a CIO, like this moment is similar, except well, now even the CEO is far more interested, right? Uh, to the moment where cloud computing came to be and, you know, those yeah. first came like the dominant companies because they had the versatility and ability to do far more and to use other services and applications and, um, you know, they could pivot much faster than someone who had like, you know, servers that and people deploying software off of like CDs onto those servers, right? Um, yeah. You know, there was a moment where people bet on it and then, you know, the conservative ones said, hey, safety is going to be an issue. All of like safety, again, a different kind of safety, more like cybersecurity. Right, right. Um, but those that like made the bets, like profited generously and others are still talking about how they're navigating their transition to the cloud. So I think like having seen that. CIO so cloud washing had it, cloud washing had its moment then it seems. I don't, think, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, I think there, it wasn't seen as immediately as beneficial. Now, now it is. And like hindsight, okay. 2020, right? I think with AI, because people don't want to miss another moment in the evolution of technology like this, everyone almost wants to like, like pump themselves up and say, Hey, I'm actually doing a lot with AI. What are you doing with AI? Right. And, right. Uh, you know, that's really where now we're just like in the, you know, the peak of like the current hype cycle where like people can do no wrong when they try AI initiatives. What they're actually doing, and you know, it may be just that they don't want to look stupid in front of their friends. <laughs> well, the, but that's the thing is that first of all, this is a longstanding concept. It's it's going into like a massive evolution with generative's capabilities. All the big tech companies are creating their own LLMs. It's it's something where you and I, as well, not you, you know a lot more about this stuff. But me as a consumer, I'm like, wow, this must be important technology if it's literally what every single big tech company is putting out and like touting as far as their 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 entrance their their player in the in the big in the big overarching consumer tech race so uh, again this goes back to when people conceptualize ai their thought is oh it's it's that chat gpt thing so they're talking about generative ai and when companies say hey we're ai powered a lot of times it is that open source you know llm that is just doing something and they put their wrapper on it that you know that like you said, it was, they gave it a UX, right? And then and tried to brand it as a product, but it is, it's really, it's, it's a data set. It's a tool. Um, so why, so I understand the nature of why companies would want to AI wash, right? It's like tapping into the zeitgeist. Everyone's talking about it anyway. So let's try and find a way to put it into the fold. Where is the line between actually utilizing, uh, artificial intelligence in product solutions in delivering services versus it's just kind of a functional tool, but it's not actually powering the end result. I mean, it depends, right? I think that like people would try to build all sorts of things, right? Um, you know, like whether, you know, I mean, you've got like a friend of mine likes to say that, you know, C3AI probably has, um, you know, a much larger market cap just because you know, they got thicker and people want to buy AI, right? So you go and you buy it. <laughs> right? Even though they're not That's really much <laughs> in the company, right? Um, so I think I'll probably be an example of one, right? Uh, but, um, you know, really like, I don't think it matters, frankly, because the products that are powered with the right kind of like architecture and the right kind of model, um, you know, I think now we're talking just about like very tactical bets, right? It's right. as old as any other software iteration, right? Where some people want to build it all themselves. Some people will buy packaged products from others. Some people would buy configurable platforms and some people will want to build their own LLM and then build on top. I think it's really just like, what are your actual problems and like, where's the right place to start? And, you know, people have done like, at least in our space, people have done absolutely everything already. Like, you know, I have clients and prospects that have done everything from, you know, like get a voice assistant from us all the way to kind of like, you know, try to build their own and work with us with our like, template assistants. Um, all the way to people who have um, such well-funded teams that they're training their own models, they're going to do it all themselves. And by and large, you know, I've been at it for a while now. I remember conversations back in 2019, 2020, where people tell me that they've got more people in that team than poly at the time. And, you know, they're going to build it all. They have the resources, they have the data. And that was AI washing, 
right? That was completely eyewash because those people have for the most part fired most of those teams now because they, the, the effort didn't amount to much. Now, of course, the technology is more powerful now, so you can do more with less. Uh, I yeah. think uh, the interesting bit was, uh, I, I don't know if this falls under your AI washing bit, but it's, uh, <laughs> we'll see a demo. They get excited. You know, they give a presentation to the wider company about like how they're using generative AI. And well, long before you know it, you know, you're off to the race, build something where you don't know how to productize it fully, how to package it up, how to feed analytics from it, how to create the right safety conditions. And then, you know, you might be in trouble, right? Um, so we'll see what the right approach is for the different, you know, application areas where people are using generative AI. And, uh, you know, like there will be winners and there'll be losers, right? And, um, I think that's, I, I don't think that the collective wave will disappoint. I think there might be people disappointed when, you know, as a bank, they start training their own LLM and two years later, they've done what, you know, five foundational startups have the resources to do and, and you know, chips, the data, the whole infrastructure around it, right? So like those guys are yeah. probably disappointed, right? Um, they may or may not admit that to themselves because they probably won't, you know, like a bank building its own LLM will not build something comparable to OpenAI or Anthropic or Mistral. Right. Others, right. Um, but, you know, I think that those using LLMs to power products will, you know, achieve efficiencies, right? Now, I think it really depends on who you're buying it from, what you're buying. You know, are you buying it mm -hmm. because it told you to buy AI? In which case, you, you may not do that well. Right? Or do you have a business problem that you're solving from and then you look at like, okay, what am I actually doing? So, you know, um, I spoke to, to a prospect recently and they're doing everything from chat automation to, you know, assistive tools with generative. And, you know, we've all seen like co-pilot demos, right? So that's very interesting. Like if you need yeah. to make a slide and you go like, look at this presentation. Now create a summarization slide. Oh no, wait, turn that into a table. Like that's fantastic, right? That's like making so many investment banking analysts redundant, right? Because, um, you know, a lot of sleepless nights will be solved with one prompt um, into, into GPT, right? But um, if we're talking about like a live problem, say you're a contact center agent, you're at your job, and, uh, you know, you've been asked a question, you don't know the answer to. Like either the answer shows up in front of you straight away and you start reading it, or more likely, right? Like it takes a bit of time for it to show up. You're mumbling in the meantime, you're reading the right to understand you're panicking. You started saying one thing, then you see another. <laughs> <laughs> listening to you. I mean, I've seen this, right? Like the system is listening to you and um, yeah, it starts listening to what you said that feeds from differently. And then the whole thing changes in front of you. And I've been fascinated with the problem because, you know, I'd love to have poly AI with a complete product offering that offers everything from full automation to assistive tools, you know, both chat and voice. We do both chat and voice, but we only do end-to-end -end automation. And the debate around like, should we be doing assistive tools is as old as the company itself, right? Yeah. And what we found to be very interesting is while the same model, the same LLM in the background can generalize and support multiple use cases in end-to-end -end fulfillment scenarios, that's not the case for an assistive tool, right? If you're quoting me different like insurance uh, things and you're like, hey, with this success payment, you'll pay me $13 a month. And with like a much larger excess, you pay me $12 a month. Like that needs to pop up and show all these differences and things. It needs to be like right. very clear to me very quickly if I'm going to communicate that to you. And to build all that, um, you can't really go and, um, um, you know, it's not that easy to create that interface that would then be reusable for all these different things. Um, so the U S yeah, with that, with that real time application without those, you know, without those moments of latency where you have to sit there and mumble until the systems can sort of like catch up to the pace of conversation there. When, um, and I really like this concept that you mentioned about sort of the early days of AI washing being as how organizations would say, Hey, we've staffed up. So it's based on, it's based on the human resource element, right? It's, oh, we've got the team that can definitely build this. And that's sort of the early premise. We don't have any of the technology, not a whisper, but we've got the team in works. So more to come. I think that's sort of fascinating and, a, and an interesting take on, I mean, it's really, what's going right? on like, now. Technology is new. No one's ever built anything functional with it. And then you're sitting there believing that you have it all, right? 
at least <laughs> have a health skepticism. It's great that you're that confident, but come on, be realistic, right? Like, um, you know, it's, it's not that easy. You, you just can't be that sure. It's not proven yet. Right. Okay. So be confident, be clear, be transparent. Don't try and put the cart before the horse. These but are ways that you... I mean, you know. I mean in, in, these, in these environments, it's difficult, right? You have to get the buy-in from people. And like, yeah. Yeah, you, they have to get a bit extra cop. And then, you know, either you're a hero or you're fired. But that's cool. I mean, that's what I always really appreciate, especially, you know, when you, when you look at like an American versus European context. Um, sure. Yeah. Always, and you know, not just us, I think every like enterprise software company has found that, you know, American companies empower stakeholders to take some risks, make some decisions. Hell, you might not even end up fired if you're transparent and you kind of like cap the, you know, the investment at the right time. Uh, in fact, the best yeah. people made a lot of mistakes and the few really, really impacts good decisions, right? And they're like, they end up in C-level roles um, because they're like visionary leaders rather than uh, people who hedge. I think um, you should be experimenting liberally. You should be experimenting internally. You should be experimenting with external vendors. And like, you know what? Funding is sloshing around everywhere. Like there are a lot yeah. of companies doing a lot of work at every level of like implementation you might want. Well, that's a key. Co- that's a key contributor to this concept of AI washing and gaining predominance is is from a funding level. Like it's just that's where dollars want to go, and so there's a little bit of that trying to capitalize on that market uh, uh, momentum and say, oh, well, the, all we have to do is kind of like you were saying earlier about buying C three AI. It's like oh, you just have the you're you right, you have the right ticker, and uh, so <laughs> you just happen to step into it. So now people are basically slapping an AI sticker on whatever they're pitching for to try and secure that funding. Well, absolutely. I mean, look, I talk to investors all the time and, you know, like, it's very interesting. I would actually tell you that it's more interesting to speak to investors who have been AI washed, right? Because, uh, you know, you'll speak to someone who's never been interesting a company before, right? And look, when we started, I was a bit more humble than I am right now. Like, um, but right now, when I, enter, when, I, when I go into a conversation, then, you know, someone's like, and how are you going to compete with OpenAI? I'm like, you haven't looked at this big much, have you? Right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's kind of like me going and, you know, talking about American football, even though, like, you know, all I know is that coach and his tactics matter a lot more than they do for real football. Right? Um, but it's, uh, and I'm sorry for it, but I'm right. <laughs> um, it's not called soccer. <laughs> okay okay yeah you know like the investors have fallen like those that have been investing in it for a while like they are pretty savvy about these things although i think for them as well this day and age is difficult to make the right bets around differentiation sure yeah i mean i think that's fair um what about what about the other side of it the future of it you know there's there's a very thin line between what could be considered what we're talking about this like AI washing light, which is just, I don't really know what I'm saying. I don't really know what you expect, but I want to make sure that I'm a part of the AI conversation and going into things like puffery or bait and switch, which have real world applications and real world finds. Uh, you know, if you, if there's, there's a potential for looking into legislating, I know there's already some active legislation as of mid 2000, uh, 23, was it, was it, was it last year where something was passed that basically prevented conflicts of interest for finance companies and uh, AI solutions within their infrastructure. Um, so it's, we're starting to trickle into responsible use of and responsible like uh, transparency of utilization of things like AI, uh, AI tools. So what do you think is the potential future for trying to regulate this to make sure that it doesn't get to an extent of violating FTC or SEC uh, regulatory requirements? I mean, RCC, I don't know. I mean, that's like, that's, that's a whole different question. Yeah, that's true. I'm not, I'm not sure about that one, right? I think that like, in terms of like using AI and like regulating it, uh, it's the wild west right now. Um, you know, I think the EU is always at the frontier of regulation, if not innovation, right? So, um, the EU AI Act is probably the most comprehensive piece of legislation with opinions and all sorts of things. I think it really like, to regulate it effectively, you kind of have to know where the buck will stop. And that's really difficult right now. Um, I sure. think, uh, for instance, recently you saw the FTC uh, talk about like banning robocalling for like a bunch of new use cases and stuff, because um, it is getting difficult for people to to know whether something's automated yeah. or not. 
it's a debate that we in our products and deployment teams have had for a long time around like whether you should be saying you're automated or not, at least in the first instance. And if you do hard, how do you say it? It has real repercussions on how people speak to the system, because even if they know that it's AI or not, like then you, you, you know, you feel the first layer of the onion. The second one is, well, uh, okay. Like if I think it's AI, do I think it's going to work or do I just like lose my shit and start screaming for the Asian, right? So, uh, yeah, the real impact, not just on like the first level is, uh, ethics slash maybe a bit of grandstanding where you're like, you know, you should be honest, transparent, et cetera. So okay, but like, you know, you should also make it a seamless experience. If you're going to use it, you need to make it functional. So you know how, like, for example, you log into a zoom call, you see that like recording bit, right? But then right. I think after some time there, they started adding that this, this call is being recorded, right? And every time someone new logs in, you hear this call is being recorded, right? To make sure that they haven't missed it, right? Uh, honestly, that doesn't improve user experience, but it ensures that people see that the call is being recorded. But you know, that dot like flashing and telling it's being recorded, you might miss it, but it's there, right? So I think like as right. we grow with these systems, uh, you know, my hope is that for automated voice, we just have a different dial. Um, and yeah, you mentioned that. Then we're just able to um, basically know, oh, it's automated. Like we teach the general population, this is not an automated experience, but we don't make a fuss of it. We don't need a 10 second warning because when you hear a 10 second warning, your experience is worse because you wasted 10 seconds. Yeah, uh, no, it's true. And it, it, it makes a lot of sense when, when you're saying, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, that just it, when it comes to regulating against nefarious use of, of this sort of concept of AI washing, right? That the focus would be on customer consumer facing applications of the technology or the systems. Like something's going on in the back end, you're using that as part of marketing material. It's teetering on puffery. Ah, it's not really the highest priority because it doesn't involve uh, the, the consumer experience, which that touch point between a business or a brand sure. and their and end users is probably. Other AI systems just look pretty generative, right? But you've had like uh, computer vision systems that ended up like doing racial profiling because of the data they were trained on. Yes. Well, this is not a new debate. It's an important debate that, you know, like it really depends on the use case. And then, you know, the more we make these systems data driven and complicated, the harder it will be to actually regulate their behavior. So you can expect basically have like stringent testing and definitions for like an AI system for a specific task, right? They need to define through the benchmarks yeah. of works. And I think that's the only way that you get to something like fair in the end. And it's also really hard to regulate whether AI is used or not, because as we tried in the first 10 minutes, like there isn't really a strict definition. It's all just technology. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to you'd have to basically get your doctorate in order to understand, interpret, and create that sort of legislation. I don't, I don't and know. How many people would, I've got, I've got, who can actually enforce it? I don't know really, because like, I I have a PhD in AI, right? And like, honestly, like, eighty percent of it became fully obsolete the moment that you know GPT three point five was out. <laughs> so like, what do I have to say? That well, thanks for your tuition. <laughs> um, I had a scholarship. Right. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, hopefully we, we produce some value on top of the society, but it's, um, stuff. I think it's like, yeah. you know, the age of an expert in this space, like the, the most creative people working with this stuff now are not the academics. In fact, people are increasingly not doing PhDs because all the people you could have done PhDs with are paid, you know, multi-million dollar salaries, you know, putting high or Google or whatever. Right. So yeah, like, they're sitting in the private sector at this stage. You know, our academic like distinction and titles and everything is worth like you know, diddly squat. So that's it. <laughs> cool, cool projection for the future. All right, that's a great point to end on too. Nick, appreciate your time. Appreciate like being able to tackle the next great like phrase that's in the headlines about AI washing and sort of how to decode it, how to get past it. Um, can't wait to talk to you next week. Awesome. Have fun in Orlando. Oh, thanks. Take care.